Florida Senate is adjourned. Signy die. No sanctuary cities, no texting while driving, but yes to t-shirts with guns and vouchers for private schools. Some of the headlines from the state legislature, a leading lawmaker is with us to break it all down. Failure to launch. The opposition fails in an attempt to take control in Venezuela. What's next for a country in crisis? South Florida plays a pivotal role. They just hoped my family would die and fade away. Holding Cuba accountable. The first lawsuits are filed demanding payback for property stolen by Castro. We'll take that to the round table. What a week. Good morning. So great to be with you this morning. And we begin with the end. This weekend's overtime sign off from Tallahassee and the last minute bills bringing big changes our way. If you don't think that what they do in Tallahassee affects your life, think again. Lawmakers just passed bills that may change the way you drive, the schools your kids attend, how much you pay in taxes, how local government treats migrants who are here without papers. Lawmakers also took the decisive action to clean up polluted algae-filled waterways and beaches and at the urging of Governor Ron DeSantis lawmakers appropriated nearly $700 million for clean water, Everglades restoration and other environmental needs. One South Florida lawmaker at the center of it all is State Senator Perry Thurston of Fort Lauderdale. He is a Democrat representing the 33rd Senate District, which is much of Central and North Broward County and represents the state in so many ways as well. Good morning. So good great morning. To be with it's you. good to be here. Yeah, well, welcome home. It's good to be home. Well, we are glad you were here. We regret we could not convince a Republican lawmaker to come and present another point of view. But Glenna and I will do our best. But <laughs> first, if we can, Senator, what's the headline coming out of the legislative session into just yesterday afternoon? Well, unlike the governor, I have a different take. I think we got a chance to see the problems with a one-party rule system where where you have an anti-immigrant flavor and a pro-gun legislation and a total disregard for the will of the uh, people. You know, Senator, the one-party rule really has been in effect in this state for probably 20 years or so. What, what was different this time? Well, I think that it seems as though the Republicans were a little bit more emboldened. Emboldened uh, maybe by the uh, changes on the Supreme Court or some other aspects of what's going on and, in and a, Excuse me. And a governor who actually got along with lawmakers as opposed to Rick Scott, who had an on-again, off-again relationship. I, I would agree. I think that uh, certainly the new governor was engaged and that probably made a difference. But, but I still think think that the outcome is that it doesn't benefit the people of the state of Florida. We need two parties to address all the issues and concerns. Mm -hmm. Even though we addressed it by major party line votes, yeah. that didn't stop the legislation. You know, Senator, one of the most controversial bills, well, we've been talking about it here for a couple of weeks, is the arming of teachers, expanding the Guardian program to arm teachers. Uh, right now, there is a full-on press by opponents to get the governor to veto it, which he, he will not do. But what what changed in the last year? Because last year's legislature, right after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High massacre, when, when really unprecedented gun safety legislation was passed, that wasn't part of it. No, it, well, it wasn't. Why now? Well, well what that happened? was a compromise last year. If you remember, we went uh, uh, to the wee hours of the morning making sure that teachers did not have guns. Right. And you had all of the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. This is one of their number one priorities. So when we have a commission that say they're following the will of the people, that's not the will of the people. We pointed out that every editorial across the state, the Parent Teachers Association, the students, the teachers, nobody wanted this. All we can surmise is that it's on someone's agenda, possibly the NRA. Well, you know, the, uh, the part of the program is the districts have to opt in. Right. Um, Dade and Broward have already stipulated they will not opt in. So what, what's wrong with having the ability to opt in, especially for some of the rural school mm -hmm. districts where the t tone and tenor is much different? Well, well, what's wrong with it is this. If you take a teacher right out of college who has a desire to teach and to motivate children, but not a desire even in a rural area to carry a gun. But now because that's there, I'm going to be sort of nudged and pressured to do that. Then that's going to be a problem along with the fact that this. 
We don't pay teachers. We don't want to give them annual contract. We don't want to secure their position, but yet we want to put them in a position to have to be law enforcement and teachers. Well, voluntary. Just right. context, yeah. 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 It, let's, let's move on to the Sanctuary Cities Bill. This was another kind of big ticket item. And of course, I think Governor DeSantis says he supports it. He's going to sign it. So local law enforcement henceforth, if they get a immigration detention detainer from ICE, they're going to have to essentially act as ICE agents, but they already do in Broward and Miami-Dade. Well, why did the legislature feel f moved to, to pass this bill? Well, I, I think it goes farther than local law enforcement. I think it goes to agencies like DCF. Anybody who comes in contact with an undocumented individual will now be required to turn them over to ICE. And I think that it's an attack on the immigrant community for no apparent reason. You know, we passed resolution uh, banning the leadership in Venezuela. But with this legislation right here, someone who's in this country who's undocumented stopped for a party parking yeah. ticket or a bad light yeah. will be subject yeah. to and deportation. And Venezuelans, we would point out, do not have TPS. That's they are not here. I mean, they're here legally on a visa, but they do not have temporary protected status. And, and, and you know, we pointed out, and this is my point, you know, we are a country of immigrants. We pointed out that there was no Native Americans on either side of the aisles. So all of us came here from some way, and we've all contributed to the culture and the vibrant and the strength of this community. You have this anti-immigrant bent, and we don't know where it's coming from. So you're not convinced that th this was a passed as a public safety law by the Republicans. So you're not convinced that this this really is a nod to safety and and addressing criminal undocumented immigrants, which is what the the law is supposed to do. Well, that criminality can be the simple fact of not having your papers, yeah. not that you committed a crime. And the reason we know that is we file several amendments clarifying that. See, the rhetoric is that it's criminals. But when we say, well, that's not what the words say, here's an amendment to clarify that. So there will be no confusion. All voted down. Yeah. And that yeah. shows me that there is a concern. Uh, Senator, let me go back just for a moment to the voucher issue, this new yeah. voucher that's going to allow 18,000 or so students uh, to attend private or maybe religious schools. Uh, there was this court case, 2007, Governor Bush tried to get this through and the state Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. Well, we have a new Supreme Court. What do you think they will do? I don't want to try to predict these right. are three good men and women who have joined the court, some from the third district right. court of appeal here in Miami. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? First of all, we're talking millions and millions of dollars from general revenue, which is why that was blocked in Bush v. Holmes. One, one, well, 130, one, to one, be exact. One, 100, <laughs> we had 136, but we'll take yeah, 130. Uh, millions of dollars taken from general revenue that could be used for public schools. It was blocked before in the case that you referenced, Bush mm -hmm. v. Holmes. You know, when you get new Supreme Court justices, the law doesn't change based on the, the makeup of the judicial, the members who are there. Right. So I think that what it, as you say, we're not going to predict what they're going to do, but it's going to be a test of the uh, impartial independence mm -hmm. of our judiciary. You know what's interesting, though? The, the family empowerment vouchers, as, right. as they're called, the, this is something that is championed in many of the communities where the schools are the most fragile and the most challenged, and many of them are your, are your constituents, really like the idea of having a voucher with money to choose where their student, where their child goes. Some of the people in my community champion that. Ninety percent of the students in my community attend public schools and what they would champion more is bringing these schools up to the level of all schools and having them have the same accountability. So is that an either or situation? I mean why not really prioritize making public schools better yet have the choice give the choice to people and families to go to the schools they want. I can tell you this, 100% of the people in our caucus on our side of all 
OWL WHO FAVOR PUBLIC SCHOOLS, YOU ADEQUATELY FUND THOSE PUBLIC SCHOOLS AND BRING THEM UP mm -hmm. TO THE LEVEL, YOU WON'T GET THE OPPOSITION THAT YOU GET. BUT yeah. IF YOU LOOK AT OVER THE COURSE OF THE LAST YEARS AND YOU SAW A REAL GOOD INDICATION BASED ON PRESIDENT LEE'S ARGUMENT AGAINST FURTHER EXPANSION OF mm -hmm. VOUCHERS. YOU yeah. LOOK AT WHAT'S BEEN HAPPENING IN TALLAHASSEE FOR THE LAST 20 YEARS, THERE'S yeah. AN UNHOLY uh, CONNECTION BETWEEN THESE CHARTER SCHOOLS AND THE FLORIDA LEGISLATURE. Yeah. Uh, SENATOR THURSTON, uh, YOU HAD ONE MANDATE, YOU AND YOUR FELLOW LAWMAKERS, PASS THE BUDGET. Right. AND YOU DID YESTERDAY right. $91 right. BILLION dollars AND STUCK DOWN IN THAT BUDGET ARE MILLIONS AND MILLIONS OF DOLLARS OF APPROPRIATIONS FOR LOCAL PROJECTS. NOW, RICK SCOTT, WHEN HE WAS GOVERNOR, WAS FAMOUS FOR EXERCISING A LINE ITEM VETO. YOU CERTAINLY HAVE SOME PROJECTS FOR YOUR DISTRICT, FOR uh, BROWARD COUNTY. Uh, WHAT'S GOING TO HAPPEN TO THOSE? Well, WELL, ABSOLUTELY. WE'RE HOPING THAT THE CURRENT GOVERNOR WILL DO A LOT BETTER THAN uh, RICK SCOTT, WHO WAS HORRENDOUS TO SOUTH FLORIDA. AND SOUTH FLORIDA, THAT I MAY ADD, IS A DONOR COUNTY. Yep. WE SEND A LOT OF MONEY TO Tallahassee AND DON'T GET NEAR THE BENEFITS THAT WE SHOULD BE RECEIVING. WE SHOULD DO AN ANALYSIS ON THAT. BUT THERE ARE A LOT OF GOOD THINGS IN THE BUDGET, ESPECIALLY FOR ENVIRONMENT AND SOME PROJECTS FOR OUR COMMUNITY. WE WOULD LIKE TO SEE THOSE NOT GET SLASHED AND burned by the veto uh, authority of the government. Thanks for the lightning round. This was <laughs> <laughs> we can talk too much more about all kinds of things and invite you back and uh, well, as these as these new laws progress. Right, the lightning round is just an indication <laughs> that there's so much going on in town. It's true. There has it's been. True. We appreciate you Senator, coming. Thanks. In. Thank you very A much. A pivotal week for the future of Venezuela ends with questions ahead for U.S. involvement. A live report just ahead, and with us here, Juan Guaido, South Florida representative and a former Marine who runs a think tank at FIU. An emotional roller coaster this week for Venezuelans in South Florida watching a failed attempt at ousting Nicolas Maduro from power. What comes next is an unsettled question. Local 10's Cody Weddle is the only South Florida reporter covering this crisis in uh, Caracas. He is in Bogota, Colombia this morning. Cody, good morning. Set the scene for us. What is the latest news from Venezuela?
Well, good morning to you guys. What a remarkable week once again in Venezuela, especially seeing Leopoldo Lopez once again on the streets. He was somehow able to convince his guards. He was under house arrest, convince his guards to let him leave. And he showed up there outside of a military base alongside Juan Guaido, saying they were organizing this military uh, rebellion. It ultimately failed. I think they had hoped that this would start to set off some type of chain reaction, you know, domino effect. They expected um, you know, military bases and generals to defect against Maduro, but really it ended in more conflicts and more violence. We saw their supporters come out on the streets and Maduro's soldiers uh, also coming out firing tear gas. And we actually saw open rounds of, of gunfire in Caracas. Then on Wednesday, this is when they had already scheduled these huge mass protests. We once again saw those conflicts, those protests and the uh, real repression from authorities as protesters once again attempted to uh, break into uh, that military uh, base where Juan Guaido was the day before. So now Leopoldo Lopez is in the Spanish embassy, and I think we enter another holding phase here until one of these sides uh, makes a move. Uh, it's, it appears we're at another standstill here, but you can bet it won't last long. We expect Leopoldo Lopez is behind the scenes here uh, trying to, to work something out, trying to regain the momentum here. But I do think we felt uh, people in the streets once again energized uh, like we hadn't seen for a few months just because of the bold move here by Juan Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez. Guys. Cody, great to have you there. We'll check in this week. Stay safe and thanks so much. All right, let's dig in deeper to what is going on in Venezuela, what happened this week, and what may happen in the future. It is very much a local story in South Florida, home to Venezuela's diaspora. In some cases, it's exile and many of those driving events there. Leonardo Trecci is the South Florida coordinator for Juan Guaido's party, Voluntad Popular, which is popular will in English. And Brian Fonseca is a former Marine and intelligence analyst at Southcom and now runs the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy at Florida International University. So great to have you both with us, with us today. Good and morning, Leonardo and Brian. So, Brian, give us your assessment. Uh, here you had this moment which many thought was going to be the tipping point on Tuesday where Maduro would be ousted, the military would flow over to the opposition to Guaido. They didn't. Right, right, they didn't. But I still think that it was important because it did show fractures within the military institution. I mean, there's some questions as to whether or not announcing that the military was behind you was indeed a good idea if the military wasn't going to jump behind you, in fact. Um, and so questions remain as to whether or not Guaido will remain credible in terms of his ability to continue to move people out in the streets and compel the military to jump sides. But I think at minimum it did show fractures within the institution. Yeah. You know, that's a, it was strategy, Leonardo. We talked about that on Tuesday yes. when we were together at that gathering in Doral. Your party's strategy, did, did it fail on Tuesday? Characterize that. I don't think so. Uh, I think we are trying to crack the military forces and uh, I think we are uh, doing exactly what we think. Uh, maybe uh, we know and you know that our the military forces in Venezuela uh, have a lot of uh, Cuban inside them. A lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, pressure from uh, an interest from Cuba there and I think that uh, that, that movement could, could uh, could be part of what happened you know, on can, Tuesday, can but, I, but, can but just, we know. Can I just say that this week from Cuba, and uh, there was a one Cuban official was asked about that and denied that mm -hmm. Cuban soldiers were in Venezuela. Uh, that's not true. Cuban soldiers and, and in Venezuela. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. uh, of course. We know, <coughs> and uh, uh, for example, I, I, I have a, a journalist in Venezuela that was captured and was uh, hit for a, for a military that mm -hmm. was from Cuba, you know, <coughs> uh, and we, we, we have a lot of proof that they are there yeah. and controlling and our, for, our army forces. Right, and Brian, by similarly, uh, Russia yeah. has forces there. We know we saw the report, I think, in the New York Times, other media, that a, a couple of weeks ago, a Russian plane flew in with right. 100 military or intelligence people and all kinds of equipment. And here on Friday, the president, President Trump, talks right. to Putin and gets off and says, well, Putin says that they are not involved in Venezuela. And that goes against what John Bolton and Mike Pompeo had said earlier yeah. in the week. I, I mean, I hope the president's not buying what Putin says over the phone, but <laughs> certainly there are Russians on the ground. And I, I think we know this. Um, and Russia's played a really important role uh, in sort of a technical advisory role as well. 
Uh, yeah. The Russians on the ground don't amount to many. I mean, 100 is not really a, a, a big deal, uh, but they are providing technical support on the ground, and that's what's, what, what I think uh, much is being assessed in, you know, in the media now. Well, you, you were in Washington this week. Yeah, yeah. Um, really week. We've heard from Washington, from officials on down, and, and our own senators, Senator Rubio, Senator Scott, that quote unquote all options are on the table. Right, right. What, what are those options? Yeah, I mean, right now it seems to be the, the two options we're, we're leveraging the most are international uh, diplomatic and economic pressure. I mm -hmm. mean, this is really it. This is about, you know, rallying countries to continue to put pressure on Maduro continue to bolster why those, you know, position as a legitimate interim right. president. The economic pressure with the sanctions, uh, I think that's, that's to the extent that we've been able to leverage those kind of instruments. Now, when we say all options are on the table, though, we're, we're referencing largely the military. The, military. The, sure. the problem is, is that we put the military as an option on the table, but we never really intended to use it. And so I wonder how much credibility the military has and is an instrument, at least for the administration, mm -hmm. if it's put out there yeah. and then it's debunked as a bluff. Right, if it's an empty threat. I mean, if we hear Secretary of State or the NSA advisor say, oh, it's an option on the table, and the president said so here as well, uh, you can't make that threat and not make good on it, can you? I mean, um, you, I mean uh, and uh, we've heard, excuse me, we've heard Mr. Guaido say, yes, it should be available, an available option. Yeah, it's, it, I, it's an option, but uh, at the beginning we are using all uh, the things that we have on the table before uh, that happens. And uh, You don't want a civil war in we Venezuela. Don't, we don't want a, a civil war in Venezuela, but we, are, we have 93% of people with President Guaido. Actually, if you speak about civil war, you have to speak about maybe colectivos that uh -huh. are civilian. Explain, that are what armed. Those, explain what the colectivos are. Colectivos are civilian that, that are armed uh, by the regime of Maduro. Uh, they have uh, arms to, to shoot the people to, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a big problem like for, a for us because it's like a gang. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a gun from, from the government of, or from the regime because it's not a government, it's an, an usurpator. You know what, Let's um, si the civil war, the prospect of it is something we really should explore a little more. Let's take a quick break and we will do that when we come right back.
We are back talking about the latest in Venezuela with Brian Fonseca, Leonardo Trecci. Uh, Leonardo, we were talking about the prospect of what could be a civil war. This week, I mean, there is fighting in the streets that already. And this week, what happened Tuesday was characterized as a coup attempt by some of the news media, and, um, by your party. But, but in essence, it's not so much a coup as in a democratic will of the people, so to speak. So how, how do you avoid this kind of clash rising to the level of civil war? Well, it's in, 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 in Venezuela, most of the people, if we President Guaido, so uh, I don't think that uh, we are uh, talking about a fight between Venezuelans. It's a fight between forces armed by the usurpator, Nicolás Maduro, and the civilians that are fighting for freedom. So well, when you, who you call it, an usurpator, an usurper, a usurper, uh, usurper is sorry, really, sorry, usurper, really someone sorry. who was, you know, has been in power for, you know, years. The party, Chavez, originally Hugo Chavez, was elected democratically 20 years ago um, and has turned into a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And so really the linchpin is the military. And if the military, to your point earlier, if the military did decide to back Guaido, is that it? Is that the linchpin? Yeah, I mean, that's, I, the military remains the key to continuity or change, right? I mean, they're the institution that really controls the shots at this point. They can either dig in behind Maduro or they can jump to the other side and, and sort of yeah. foster the rise of Guaido. But, but I, I saw you quoted in the Miami Herald, Brian, as essentially saying, the military overall is not so much behind Maduro, but behind yeah. their privileged position. Yeah. The fact that they have perks and money and food and things that ordinary citizens don't have. I mean, that's that's absolutely part of it. It's it's also that they've been entrenched in the in the widespread corruption and illicit activity taking place within Venezuela too, and that was by design. Maduro, Chavez prior to Maduro, engaged the military in these illicit activities for the purpose of tying their survival to the survival of the regime. Right. Yeah, if we can, I want to hear, there was this meeting Thursday in Doral between um, exile leaders, your party, and Senator Scott and Rubio, Congressman Mario Duz Ballard, and Senator Rubio, who's a leading voice here, you know, characterized what happened on Tuesday as not a defeat for Mr. Guaido and the party. Here's, here's Senator Rubio. This notion that Maduro's winning and the opposition is ridiculous. This is a movement, a peaceful movement of civil disobedience. And the only battle that movements of this civil disobedience movements lose every battle except the last one. And that's, what we, that's why the biggest enemy we face here is despair. Because that's what they're counting on. Despair. Uh, Leonardo, I mean, it, does Guaido still have the power to uh, inspire the people of Venezuela to come for a democratically elected government? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, Guaido has uh, this power, and now with uh, Leopoldo Lopez on the streets uh, leading together this movement, movement uh, there is more reasons to, to fight for freedom in Venezuela. Brian, do you think U.S. sanctions are actually working? Financial sanctions, oil sanctions, are, they, are, are there signs those are working? Well, I, I think that the sanctions take some time to really take take foot um, and create the kind of, of economic struggle um, that, that challenges the ability of the government to stay in power. So I think over the long term, they will continue to put pressure. The question becomes whether or not Maduro can bypass those sanctions, leveraging the relationship that it has with, uh, Venezuela, I mean, with Russia, with, with China, with Turkey. I mean, those were all partly designed to bypass U.S. sanctions when they were put into effect. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the question. Can they bypass them? Well, we will see. Brian Fonseca, great to have you come back. And Leonardo Trecci, mm -hmm. we appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Many thanks. When we come back, we're taking it all to the round table. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. We have so much to talk about today with our powerhouse roundtable. The legislative session that ended yesterday, the turmoil in Venezuela. Well, let's get to it. But first, some introductions. We have a great panel today. Juan Carlos Planes. JC is an attorney in Miami and a former Republican state representative. He served in the state house from 2002 to 2010 and keeps a close eye on the legislature. Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale and a former Democratic state representative and senator, also keeping an eye there. Tim Padgett is a busy man this week, the America's <laughs> correspondent for WLRN, Miami Herald News, covering Latin America and the Caribbean, and he did that as well for Time Magazine, and might I say for us too, in many respects. <laughs> so, so Enjoy nice it. to have you all. Great to see you. you. J.C. Planas, um, let's sort of begin with a bottom line assessment. It seems to me that this session of the legislature was a slam dunk for the Republican leadership and Governor DeSantis. Democrats did not do very well at you all. You know, it's, it, what's interesting is, and, and this was pointed out in the Herald, DeSantis had about the same numbers in the legislature that Rick Scott did, but because DeSantis was such a much more effective communicator with the legislature right. and understood the process more, he was able to get more of what his wish list was than Rick Scott was ever able to do. Um, and is, is starting off as a very successful governor. I think one of my favorite victories was, and they brought him into the floor when they passed <laughs> it, this was one of Jeb Bush's Jeb victories Bush. as well. Yeah. But you know, a after the election, Chris Smith, the, the yes. governor did a lot of things that really raised eyebrows in a good way among Democrats. Mm -hmm. about the environment and, and the, you know, some education money. Uh, it's been a real mixed bag with him. I mean, in some sense, you've seen him go way to, you know, his Donald Trump roots. But in some sense, he's you know done some things that have uh, um, helped the Democrats and made us a, a little bit happy. But it, I agree that this was a session in which you went far right on a lot of the issues. But one thing I noticed um, with Governor DeSantis uh, as opposed to Governor Scott, DeSantis comes in as kind of an insider. Well, remember when Rick Scott came in, he came in as an outsider. He didn't really yeah. know any legislators or know the process. Right, he was yeah. gonna be the new sheriff in town, but yes. it turned out to be very much like the old sheriff, <laughs> yeah, yes. you know, uh, Tim Padgett, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let me get your view on the Sanctuary Cities bill. I mean, in so many ways, what this does is that it puts Florida in line with uh, the Trump administration with 2020. I mean, the larger theme here is not very welcoming to immigrants, undocumented immigrants. It could cast that pall over immigration. There's no doubt about that. But on the other hand, there really wasn't any such thing as a sanctuary city right. in, Florida. in Florida. Not even Miami-Dade <laughs> County uh, right. uh, what was, was considered a sanctuary uh, refuge for immigrants. I think the big question that's going to come out of this, and it's a big Tenth Amendment issue, and I think that's one of the big problems with this whole legislation, is that you're going to see a lot of municipalities and counties saying, okay, great, we're not going to be sanctuary cities. Now, what's the federal government going to do in terms of reimbursing us right. for helping you nab mm -hmm. these illegal undocumented it's immigrants? It's an unfunded who, who, mandate in many exactly. respects, as the police chief of the city of Miami said. Yeah. You know what I find fascinating, we were talking about it with uh, Senator Thurston, is um, the Venezuelans who might be here yeah. without documentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, on one hand... Visa overstays quite a visa bit. Visa yeah. overstays and, and you watch what happens and say, can you blame them at the moment? But no. you have this push for, you know, hardline on immigration, yet by the same people who are very hardline against the government they're trying to oust right now in Venezuela, how do you send those people back? I, I think there's a lot of contradictions in the immigration yeah. policy of the Trump administration. I mean, mm -hmm. just the economic numbers that we saw Friday. If we don't accept a lot more legal immigrants, we could tank the economy because once the economy uh, heats like that, if right. you don't have a constant feed of worker class, you're going you're to screw right. up the economy. And I think that's been, for us economic conservatives, that's been one of the most troubling things of this new Republican Party on immigration. Yeah. It's, it's economically foolish. From yeah. a historical standpoint, it was amazing to see a southern yeah. state invite the federalism of their local law yeah. enforcement. Yeah. I mean, given the history of the South, right. what we're basically saying is, okay, we're gonna federalize our local and enforce this federal law here in, in Florida and make our local sheriffs and our local police officers Agents federal of officers. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. to Glenna's point, I think we're gonna see a lot more pressure now being put on uh, Congress to, and the Trump administration to give groups like the Venezuelans temporary protected yes. status. Yeah. We're really gonna see that build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Chris Smith, you have been in the legislature for those many years you served. 
a champion of education and yes. public education. Now we're going to see, as Lena pointed out earlier with Senator Thurston, $130 million out of the state general checking account, as it were, that's going to go for these scholarships to allow kids to go to private and even religious schools. And that is money that could have been spent for traditional public schools. And I think that's the biggest difference because we've had a voucher program for many years, but it was a tax credit program. Right. A corporation gives money, take it off on their taxes. But this is money directly out of general government that could go for fixing the roof at a school or fixing up some of our schools or even putting, you know, more resource officers in the schools that are going to go now to private schools and more importantly, religious schools. And yeah. because of, I guess, our new Supreme Court, they think that it's going to pass through. We don't have Justice Perriente or Justice Quince anymore. We have three new justices that are, I mean, good, you know, good people, but I guess they will have another uh, view of the constitutionality of this voucher program. The, the, the money travels with the student, Chris, and I think that's the important thing. I think that when we look at what students would go into the private school system, the money will go with them. It's not just going to be some sort of block grant. I think that and people ask me, if you're so anti-Trump, why are you still a Republican? I think this is one of the issues where I, I'm firmly in the conservative camp. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the current system has given too few choices to parents, too few choices to students, and this is just another way to make sure that parents get the opportunity that I got to go to a private school, to have the opportunity that my kids have who go to a, a, a Catholic school. I think all parents should be entitled to this choice. But what do the taxpayers themselves think about this. In full disclosure, my wife is a public school teacher, and I think one of the big issues hanging over this, and one of the big questions is, okay, if we do shift this money from the taxpayer to the family that wants to send that money to private schools, why in this state are we not mandating that private schools meet the same requirements mm -hmm. that public schools have to meet? You know, meet? I, I hear that accountability argument a lot. Yeah. Private schools do have accountability yeah. standards. They, they may not be the same as the Florida State standards, but, but, but if, if I could just be devil's arch advocate Archdiocesan schools have their own accountability. I mean, in, in archdiocese schools, you have standardized testing. Mm -hmm. You don't have the reporting requirements that the public schools have, but yet we still see the college graduation or the college acceptance numbers fairly high. We see the high school graduation numbers yeah. much, much higher. Can I, can I just play devil's advocate yes. for a moment and say, I listen to a lot of people talking about the Florida standards and mm -hmm. the standards <clears throat> are fine. It's the way they're measured and teaching to the test gets a lot <clears throat> of controversial attention of we don't want my, I don't want my student sitting in a classroom in public school just being taught to pass a test. And so that kind of accounti accountability I've heard, people feel like has a, a great big downside. But as you talk about tr money traveling with the student, whenever you take away pieces of that pie, that makes it worse for those that are left behind. So you can keep taking money out, keep taking money out. Those that are still in our traditional public schools, our constitutional public but, but schools, we can, we can are going to be left behind with less we can money. Reform. I think the one important thing, the district cost differential is back. Finally, I think this is the one good news for our Miami-Dade they public schools. They did bring that back? They, yes, they did the study last year. It's starting to be implemented. It is going to be fully implemented next year, but we took our first giant step on bringing back the cost so differential. South Florida gets its money back. Yes. Stay tuned, more Roundtable right after the break.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of a very good roundtable with J.C. Planis, Miami attorney, former state representative, former state senator, representative Chris Smith, Tim Padgett from WLRN, uh, America's <coughs> reporter. Tim, talk with us a little bit about the situation in Venezuela. As we said earlier, um, Tuesday was the day that Guaido right. said, the military is going to come to me. Well, he told the Washington Post yesterday, I misfigured. I really thought the military was going to move over and support the opposition, and they didn't. And the problem is, it's the third time he's misfigured. This happened in January, happened in February, and now it happened this past week. The problem here is, we are succumbing to this rather foolish notion that regime change in Venezuela is going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think if we learned anything this past week is that we've got to take two steps back and realize that taking down authoritarian regimes takes time. And we're going to have to take that time now, especially when we're taught, as Brian Fonseca said, that we're dealing with a military that is firmly entrenched, has drug ac uh, trafficking accusations. Hey, it's going to be a very difficult negotiation with the military to get it to turn, but we've got to take the time. There's a lot of wishful thinking. I mean, a lot of people hope that Maduro ends up like Nicolae Ceausescu did. I mean, that, the Romanian mm -hmm. revolution was 48 right. hours, and the military turned overnight. Um, it's not going to happen like or that. Or Gaddafi. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. the pictures of Gaddafi. Gaddafi is the same thing. You know, and, yeah. and, and, and again, we've seen it before, so we wish it. But with something like Venezuela, yeah. where there's oil money, where there's right. drug money, that's a problem. Those, those countries didn't have that entrenched corruption. How important is it, though, that by their constitution, there should be a President Guaido? I mean, that is what the constitution says at the moment. That's the, le that's the leverage he has, and that's yeah. what he should be using then to create cracks in the wall, and then you exploit those cracks. That's how you bring regimes like this down. Tuesday wasn't a failure. The problem is it, it, it ended up looking like a failure because of what they promised, which is we're going to bring the regime down today. But in reality, it was another crack in Maduro's wall. Ma and that's Maduro a will fall. If you are going to be an effective dictator, yeah. trains must run on time. Right. Trains don't run right. on time. Right. He yeah. will eventually yeah, fall. But, but, but it's going to take some time. Yeah. I mean, short of yeah. military intervention, when you look at all of these regime changes, it takes some time. And I think what Senator Rubio said this week about having patience and not, you know, yeah. just falling back. Right. Having patience, in, but still working. Patience don't mean just sitting around, yeah. but working hard about it. I think we will get there. Look at Sudan and, last month. That yeah. took a lot of time. Right. Yeah. We also heard from, uh, along with Senator Rubio, Senator Rick Scott, who's <coughs> been very outspoken, mm -hmm. very hawkish. Here's what the Senator Scott had to say. So I believe it's time for American military and the military of every democracy around the world to say enough's enough. We're going to stop this genocide. Boy, that's about as hawkish as you get, Tim. I, I mean, we talked about it with Brian Fonseca and Leonardo Trenchy. You know, the idea that even the U.S. military would line up at the Colombian border to take in humanitarian aid, uh, I mean, that puts American soldiers' uh, lives at risk. The rhetoric is not helpful for, for, for two reasons. One, as you said, it, it's not a threat really that we're going to go through with because mm -hmm. if we did go through it, we would be looking at an Iraq-style quagmire in Venezuela. But if we're not going to go through with it, it reduces our credibility right. and it also scares away our international coalition that we've been able to cobble together, especially in Latin America, right. on this. And we need those countries to help, again, right. negotiate with the military to get them to turn. Yeah. Well, uh, let me just switch gears a little bit this week. Huge development, uh, Helms-Burton Title III. Uh, 22 years after actually being on the books, the Trump administration, part of the changes is now citizens, U.S. citizens who had property in Cuba, who was con it was confiscated by the Cuban government during the revolution, can now sue for it. And two entities did in South Florida this week. Um, one of the interesting things, both were owners of families, were owners of the ports, Santiago, Havana Docks. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Carnival cruise ships, and Carnival was the subject of the lawsuit, but there are other cruise ships that dock there under different companies well, with OFAC licenses, Treasury licenses under U.S. law, J.C. Plan is doing business there under current U.S. law. How, how does that work with these, these lawsuits now being well, filed? Well, I, I think we knew that when Obama opened up mm -hmm. Cuba and cruise ships started going there, there would be a negative backlash eventually. I think we're seeing that now. I don't know whether this is going to work. And I also think that some of the other Helms-Burton lawsuits that may be uh, on the pipeline mm -hmm. 
may have results of ousting people in this community that didn't people maybe not realize do you know what, what do you mean by that? business I, I think mm -hmm. that you know this is something that's dangerous because you never know what's going to happen you never know who may have had business in, in Cuba. I think we have other people in this community who may have benefited from, from confiscated properties and we don't know yet. So yeah. we're going we, on the we, unknown. We, and yeah. we should point out that the U.S. Claims Settlement Commission has already certified over 5,800 sure. yeah. claims yeah. from people who mm -hmm. lost properties uh, to the Castro regime and have filed claims. They've been certified. I mean, the ones you covered this on, uh, on Tuesday, Glenna, I mean, these are certified claims. Certified claims waiting to be put into the courts, but uh, many of them have businesses or properties in Cuba where the businesses on those properties are Canadian or Italian. Mm -hmm. And I think from what I've understood, the 22 years of hiatus in filing these law lawsuits was a U.S. nod to its allied countries whose entities mm -hmm. are on these properties. That's, that's the <laughs> difference between the certified claims yeah. that you're talking about and what's going on now. These lawsuits have a much more of a foreign policy component to them, yeah. and that is yeah. to scare away foreign investment right. in Cuba. Right. But I think um, JC had a good point about Pandora's box opening it up yes, now yes. with a lot of U.S. corporations that have been doing businesses yeah. and that are currently doing business. You kind of opening up Pandora's box. It's going to be interesting to yeah. see. Well, we'll see what's in there. What comes out. All right, Cuba gentlemen. is a big Pandora's box. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for coming in. Great. 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 Thank Thanks Thank so much. You. All right. So to come, my personal perspective on the possible use of U.S. military troops in Venezuela and why that should not happen. All right, who's ready for summer? Here's a live look now from our tower cams across South Florida. And here is weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with your Sunday forecast. Yeah, check out the temperature already up to 89 degrees. We are just shy of that 90 degree mark. And with all that nasty humidity we have, feels more like 94. That's the heat index that we have all afternoon long, at least until we get some storms going. Some of those storms could be on the strong side. Check them out developing within the next few hours, mainly inland, and then pushing towards the coastline. 
Same focal point as yesterday, where most of the storms are around and north of Miami and the Keys. You're going to stay completely dry all day long today, but we'll have to watch some of these storms. They could contain some frequent lightning, could get some minor flooding out of some of this, and also some strong wind gusts. But a front that's on the way dissolves pretty much right on top of us, and it leaves us with temperatures only down to 85 degrees. So it's not a big cold front by any means. And the moisture sticks around, so rain chances linger into next weekend, guys. Brandon, thank you. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective about Venezuela and the battle to bring down the Maduro regime. No question, it's got to go. Nicolas Maduro is an incompetent thug whose socialist policies have ruined a once wealthy democratic nation, turned it into a desperate, repressive, authoritarian state. The people there are suffering terribly and rising up behind Juan Guaido to take their country back. We hope they can, and the U.S. should pitch in and help with diplomatic pressure and humanitarian aid. But that aid should not include U.S. troops. Venezuelans have to be the authors of their own recovery, of taking back their government and installing a democratically elected leader. There are many things the U.S. can do to help achieve that, but U.S. boots on the ground is not one of them. I can't think of anything more foolish or dangerous, and yet that's pretty much what Senator Rick Scott is calling for. If Maduro doesn't step aside, all the bad actors are there. Russia's there, China's there, Iran's there, Hezbollah's there. We're going to have a Syria. It's going to impact Colombia, it's going to impact Panama, it's going to impact Brazil, it's going to impact all the countries in that region. And then what? They're, two, what, 2,000 miles from Florida? They can come up right up through Central America, up through Mexico, into the United States. We already know there are terrorists trying to come across our border. Now, that is a scary prospect, but it's not going to happen. Senator Scott sympathizes, empathizes with the suffering Venezuelan people. He wants them to throw off the yoke of Maduro's tyranny, and so do all of us. But this talk of malign foreign actors winning in Venezuela and then invading our country, country to commit acts of terrorism, that is just loony. It reminds me of the arguments that the Hawks used back in the 1960s when the Vietnam War was ramping up. They said, if we don't fight the Viet Cong in Vietnam, we're going to be fighting them one day right here at home. So the U.S. went to war big time in Vietnam and lost big time. 58,220 American soldiers died. That was my generation's war. The U.S. should not lose one single American soldier in Venezuela. Senator Scott is talking about U.S. troops standing close by to take in human humanitarian aid into Venezuela from Colombia or airdropping it. That would be seen as an act of war. Bullets would be fired in anger. Senator Scott's support for a free Venezuela is genuine. But under no circumstances should U.S. troops take part in fighting to bring down Maduro. Yes, the U.S. can help, but not on the battlefield. That is my perspective for this week. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, stay informed, get involved. But wait, there's more. <laughs> this was Miami-Dade College oh yesterday. Goodness. Michael Putney got a degree, an honorary degree, another degree, we should say, of arts and letters. There's Eduardo Padron, the president of Miami-Dade uh, college. What a beautiful honor that was for you. It was a tremendous honor to be with Dr. Padron, who is an iconic figure in our community. God bless him. And you graduated, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. Catch any of our shows on Local10.com. And right there, you can subscribe to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast online. Stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next. <laughs> <laughs>